Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Monella Drisi, author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking about why narcissists get worse in Ramadan. I'm answering this question because I get asked it a lot, and so I wanted to give you some clarity on what happens to a narcissist mindset during the holy month when the Prophet Muhammad said that the shayateen are chained. So this is where a lot of confusion happens because, as you know from my previous podcast, I tell you that narcissistic personality disorder is fueled by the qareem. Okay, it's fueled by a narcissist jinn devil. So if the devils are chained during Ramadan, then what makes a narcissist's behavior get worse during this month? Okay, I'm going to answer this for you, inshallah, in today's podcast. So before I jump into it, as always, kindly like, share and subscribe to the channel. When you like the podcast, it helps the YouTube algorithm to show the podcast in search results and in recommended videos for people to benefit from. And of course, by sharing the podcast with the people you know, you'll be helping to spread this knowledge and to get people the help they need, inshallah. So if you need one-to-one counselling and coaching, you can reach out to me below. My email is in the description box. Just send me a brief about your case and I'll get back to you, inshallah. And if you're new to this channel, I'd like to welcome you. And I pray that my content helps you in your healing journey and also opens your eyes to a different perspective, the Islamic perspective on the subject of narcissism and personality disorders. So I'm going to start the podcast with the hadith that mentions the devils being chained up in Ramadan and I will explain it from there. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا كَانَ أَوَّلُ لَيْلَةٍ مِنْ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ صُفِّدَتَ الشَّيَاطِينُ وَمَرِدَتُ الْجِنِّ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ فَلَمْ يُفْتَحْ مِنْهَا بَابْ وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ فَلَمْ يُغْلَقْ مِنْهَا بَابْ So the translation of this is, on the first night of Ramadan, the devils are chained and the evil jinn, and the doors of hell are closed and no door from it opens, and the doors of paradise are opened and none of them are closed. So I just want to go back to the beginning of this hadith where the Prophet Muhammad says, صُفِّذَةَ الشَّيَاطِينُ وَمَرَدَةُ الْجِنْ so in the Arabic language, the word shaitan means the rebellious one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called these devils a shayateen because they are kuffar. Okay, they rebel against Allah and his laws. So the mission of the shayateen is to make everyone deviate from the path of righteousness right? Deviate from Islam, deviate from having any connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing the opposite of what Allah's told us to do. So that's why we get, you know, whispers from our qareen to commit major sins and, and all those things. So their prime mission is to make people kuffar, okay, disbelievers. And then he mentions maradat al-jinn. Maradat al-jinn are the evil jinn, okay? So for example, the ones who are involved in black magic, the ones who mess with your mental health and work on you so hard until you develop a personality disorder. And sometimes they will give you such bad waswas, like it's so strong and so frequent that it can actually cause someone to go insane. So maradat al-jinn are the types of jinn who do these evil things to human beings. And the Prophet Muhammad he mentioned maradat al-jinn so that we know it's not all jinn. Not all the jinn are locked up. Okay, It's the most evil ones who are locked up. So there will be many people who will still be influenced by their qareen and other jinn during Ramadan, but they won't be influenced by the most evil ones. Okay, So... The evidence for this is because people still get waswas, right? During Ramadan, during fasting hours, you can still get evil thoughts. You can still be afflicted by black magic and all sorts of things. So it doesn't mean that they completely go away. Your qareen is with you from the moment you are born until you die. 
However, the influence of the Qareen upon a human being during the month of Ramadan is lessened because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the most evil shayateen. Now, this does not include shayateen al-ins. Remember, we have shayateen al-jinn and we have shayateen al-ins. Shayateen al-ins still roam the earth, still roam the earth during Ramadan. And that's why we see horrors happening around the globe in war, like with Palestine, we still see so much evil happening because shayateen al-ins are still here. It's shayateen al-jinn who have been chained. Okay, so Iblis and his army generals, right? The ones who give all the commands and all the orders to the minions. Okay, they're the ones who are chained and locked up. Imam Abu Khuzaymah, rahimahullah, said that it's actually one of the greatest blessings of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chains the maradat al-jinn, the evil jinn. And I want you to notice something as well in the hadith. The word suffidat means chained and not locked up. So they're still here, but they are restricted to how much damage and influence they can have on us in Ramadan. Okay, so you can be sitting in front of someone who is chained, but because of the shackles they have upon them, there's only so much they can do. So they may only be able to talk, for example, and not physically approach you. So Allah doesn't take away the shayateen. And this explains why there's still so much evil in the world during Ramadan. The shayateen are still here. They're just chained. So it doesn't mean that the shayateen have no influence on people at all. Rather, it just indicates that they become weaker in Ramadan and they're unable to do what they normally can do in the rest of the year so they still whisper okay we still get the waswas and people still cast spells on on other people and the magicians still do their work and people will continue to commit major sins even when they're fasting i'll come on to that inshallah later in the podcast so it doesn't stop people from committing sins because that's the general idea a lot of people have that the shayateen are locked, which means everyone should be on their best behaviour. But this is the wrong interpretation of the hadith. Shaykh ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala weakens the shayateen in the month of Ramadan so that we can understand our level of nafs. Okay, so when the influence of the waswas is taken away, we can assess where we are in our level of nafs and how much we have been influenced by our waswas. So when we start acting and behaving in accordance to what our nafs naturally is inclined to, then we will have a better idea of where our weaknesses lie. And he also said that the shayateen will influence a person in the month of Ramadan in accordance to how well he perfects his fast or her fast. So your qareen will not be able to influence you negatively during Ramadan if you fast properly. And what does it mean to fast properly? When you fast, you need to accompany the fasting with prayers. You need to be reading Quran. You need to be giving charity. You need to be on your best behavior. So you apply, you know, good morals and principles to your life which means you're not swearing at people, you're not getting angry at people, you're exercising patience with the people around you, you're not harming others, you're not backbiting, you're not deceiving and scamming and engaging in major sins while you're meant to be fasting. Because fasting is not just about the abstinence of food and drink, it's also the abstinence of sins. Okay, so your eyes will sin, your hands will sin, your legs will sin, your feet will sin by, you know, going to the places you shouldn't be going to. When you abstain from every sin you could be committing, then your entire body is fasting from every wrongdoing. So this is what Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, meant when he said that a person will repel the shayateen from him or her during Ramadan when they perfect their fasting. And this is the perfection of fasting when you do it properly in this manner. So the people who are going to be affected by the shayateen and what little influence they have in Ramadan will be those who do not follow these steps in fasting. Okay, so they're not protected 
from the shayateen because they're doing things here and there that either invalidates their fasting or the intention behind the fasting is not that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so they might be fasting because they feel like they have to or they're fasting because if they don't, people are going to talk and they're going to get a bad reputation or their family's going to get a bad reputation or they're going to be exposed for being an atheist or you know, not wanting not wanting to do it anyway. So people have different intentions for fasting in Ramadan. Not everyone will do it because they see it as an act of worship that brings them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it's an obligational pillar of Islam. So you'll find people who fast in Ramadan for many different reasons. So if someone's intention is not to fast in Ramadan for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the shayateen will have a hold on that person during the month of Ramadan. And when the shayateen have a hold over somebody who has a low level of nafs, they're going to be far worse in the Ramadan because of the abstinence of food. So the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking us to abstain from food and drink for 30 days is because he knows that if we can master the art of self-discipline when it comes to food, which is needed for survival, then we can master the art of self-discipline in every area of life. And when I say every area of life, I mean desires mainly. Okay, so the things that we crave, the things that we desire, many of which might not be lawful. Okay, so for example, some people might crave to smoke. And that could be cigarettes, could be drugs, it could be eating magic mushrooms, or to drink alcohol, or to engage in unlawful sexual activity. Or it even could be to excessively eat. Yeah, because even that can you know, cause problems for your body and it's considered to be unlawful because you force your body into a sickness as a result of, you know, overeating and especially if it's unhealthy food. So these are all things that we do not need for survival. So if we can master self-discipline in what we need for survival, then it'll be easier to master it and implement self-discipline in our desires. So people who have a low level of nafs will really struggle with this because they are ego-driven, they are ego-led, their qareen enslaves them to their desires. So when Ramadan comes, and by the way, narcissists really do not look forward to Ramadan, especially those who have no intention of ever changing, they feel like they've been thrown into the deep end and they are put in a situation where they have to control their nafs because their public image now depends on it. So like I said before, narcissistic people, more often than not, do not do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, I would say over 90% do it because they have to, as opposed to wanting to, because it's only a minority of narcissists who actually want to change. So for the majority, it's a huge inconvenience to go for 30 days without food and have to abstain from haram relationships and have to you know, stop their shisha and their smoking and, and everything that they depend on to regulate their emotions and their nervous system so they can get through life, okay? So I've mentioned it in previous podcasts, but I'll repeat it here again. Narcissists are often addicts. You'll always find a narcissist addicted to something and again, that could be drugs, it could be pornography, it could be sources of supply, so they always have to be in a new relationship. It could be video games, it could be smoking, it could be anything. They will always have something that they are addicted to, and that gets them through life because it's an escape. When someone has an addiction to something, it's more often than not an escape from their own emotions and having to deal with their inner self and their true self and their shame, and everything that comes with it. Okay, so narcissistic people are people who run away from themselves. They don't want to look in the mirror, they don't want to hold themselves accountable, and they don't want to address their issues. So when they latch onto an addiction, it gives them that escape from all their problems. It's like a, like a plaster over the wound that they will just keep applying, even though the wound under the plaster keeps on getting more infected 
and it's rotting away because it's not being cleaned and addressed properly. Okay, so just think of the addiction as a plaster. They keep slapping on to a dirty wound and an open wound because they don't want to address it. It's too painful to address it. So they have to have something they run to as an escape to be able to cope with everything that's going on in their life. So when they have to abstain from the addiction during Ramadan, it causes them to rage. It causes them to lash out at people and it causes them to overly exaggerate anger and irritation. And you're just thinking, How on earth did you escape from your shackles? <laughs> because they just become a devil in their own right. During Ramadan, when everyone is trying their best to be patient and maintain peace. So if they're abstaining from their addiction to save face and show everyone they're fasting, then... They're going to be cranky to a whole new level. And subhanAllah, another wisdom behind the devils being chained up in Ramadan is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know the true face of the people around us and to also check ourselves. Okay, so if we are the ones who are cranky, if we are the ones who are abusive or highly irritable during Ramadan and snappy and all of that, then it's out of mercy from Allah's power ta'ala that he's allowing us to see that while we're fasting. And if the people around us are a completely different person or much worse during fasting hours, then Allah's power ta'ala is showing us the reality of those people. Because now their nafs is laid bare. You can now see where this person is in their level of nafs. Because they have nothing now to rely on as a crutch to cover up their true self. Okay, So narcissists always project the false self onto people because they are able to regulate. Like I said, they're able to regulate their emotions and their behaviour with the supply they obtain from wherever, whichever source. And without it, their true self is revealed. So you no longer see the false self, you see the true self. Now, there are some narcissists who are the opposite. Sometimes they can be on their best behavior during Ramadan. These are usually the low-level narcissists. And then they switch back to their true self after Ramadan ends. And the reason why many of them do this, they make this switch at the end of Ramadan, is because the devils have been released. Okay, the devils have been released and now this low level narcissist has been influenced again by the most evil of shayateen al-jinn. So I'll come on to more about that in a moment. So I'll start with explaining the three types of low level narcissist before I move on to the malignant narcissist or the narcopath. So the first type of low level narc will be the one who moans all the time in Ramadan okay so they feel like oh I'm being forced to fast I don't like it I don't like abstaining from food I'm hungry I'm this I'm that I've got a headache I'm so dizzy they don't stop complaining they're always complaining about all the symptoms that they're getting as a result of fasting and they just get really cranky and really annoying to be around because they over dramatize how tired they are, and how lazy fasting is making them, and how they've got a headache and they don't want to talk to anyone, and they're too tired to do the school run, or to make dinner, or to get up for prayer, or to just do daily things, right? Sometimes they might just come home from work and just go straight to bed and not care about their responsibilities at home. They make a really big deal out of fasting. Like, they're such drama queens when it comes to fasting and I'm talking about adults here I'm not talking about children or teenagers I'm talking about adults and these adults could be your husbands your wives your parents your siblings your kids whoever um, this is what you're going to see from a narcissistic man child or a narcissistic woman child they just couldn't care less about how you feel and what it is that you have to put up with because they're not enjoying the fasting at all. And they can't wait for it to be over. And they're counting down the days. And they just feel like it's too much effort for them to do. 
And, you know, don't even mention going to Taraweeh and, and all those things. These are the types of narcissists who will make their excuses to get out of, you know, going to pray Taraweeh or going to the mosque and so on. So they're really cranky. Okay, they're really cranky because they're unable to eat and unable to smoke and do all of those things that they would normally do because they worry about their reputation. They don't want people giving them lectures. They don't want people thinking that they're bad Muslims because they've put up this whole facade of being a good Muslim. So now they've got to stick with it during Ramadan. They have to show everyone that they're fasting and that they're doing a good job of it. But they won't be moaning in front of strangers or other people. They'll just be moaning at home to you. Only you will see that. But when they're with other people, you will see them offering help to you know, move house or move furniture and, you know, do strenuous things that they normally wouldn't do during fasting. But they want to show people that even when I'm fasting, I'm going to do all these things for you. I'm going to do all these favors for you because I'm such a great person. And I want you to believe that I'm a great person because I know one day you're going to hear about abuse that I've inflicted on my parents, on my kids, on my wife, on my husband, and I don't want you to believe it. I want you to tell everyone, no, I can't believe that such a person would do such a thing. You know, even when he was fasting or even when she was fasting, she came out and she helped me do this and this and this and this. This is why they do it. You know, they go out of their way to do these things. They find the energy and the time to go and do things for other people. But when you ask them to do simple things at home, like, can you wash the dishes? Can you do the laundry? Can you make dinner tonight? They kick up a fuss and it's like you've asked them to bring you the moon. So malignant narcissists do this as well. They are known for it. But the man child and the woman child, they do it more because they lean more towards the codependency end of the scale, which means that they have this need for people's approval more than the malignant narcissist who doesn't really care about having the approval of people. They just care about power and control. The man child or the woman child, they want people's approval. They don't care about your approval, the people whom they're living with. But they want the approval of strangers because they have to maintain that nice guy or that nice woman public image. So there'll be a nightmare at home. It'll be like dealing with a teenager or a young child at home. But in public, you see a completely different face and it really irritates you. This is one of the things that really irritates empathic people during fasting hours because they have to restrain their anger and they have to restrain like their upset when they see the double face of the man child or the woman child and especially when they get complimented oh you've got such a wonderful husband oh you've got such a wonderful wife oh your kids amazing I wish my kids were like your kids I wish my parents were like your parents and you're gritting your teeth because they're a completely different person at home you are babysitting a grown man at home because he cannot take responsibilities he is moaning all the time about not eating and not being able to have a cigarette and so on and so forth okay so that's the first type of narcissist whom you could be dealing with during Ramadan now the second type of low-level narc whom you could be dealing with is the narcissist who just breaks all the rules okay they will just sneak behind the house and they'll have that cigarette during fasting hours or they'll eat and they just don't care. Like, I'm hungry. I can't do this. This is not something I can do. I don't care if you like it, don't like it, not my problem. What I do and don't do is between me and Allah and you're not supposed to get involved in it. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm a grown man, I'm a grown woman and I don't need you babysitting me and... Stop stop being on my back about, you know, having a cigarette or eating. So they will feel the shame of it because it's usually when they're caught out rather than them doing it in front of you like the malignant narc would. So when you catch a man child or a woman child eating or breaking the rules of Ramadan, then they will feel the shame, but they will defend themselves by saying that my deen is between me and Allah, don't get involved. Oh, they'll make an excuse for doing that. So, oh, I felt so dizzy today and I felt really sick and that's why I broke my fast. 
but they will be really annoyed that you caught them, really, really annoyed. And to punish you for catching them out, they will, again, they will just be so lazy at home. You will find yourself picking up after them. You'll be the one running around, you know, looking after the children, bathing them, putting them to bed, cooking the iftar meals, doing the laundry, doing the dishes. You'll find yourself cleaning the house all the time because they can't be bothered. And this is more a complaint that men have about their narc wives than the other way around. So narcissistic women are notorious for this, the woman child. The husband will always feel like he has to run around and do everything because she can't be bothered, because she's got this attitude of, well, take it or leave it, I'm not going to do it. So he's trying to keep the peace in the household. He doesn't want a drama he doesn't want problems, he's fasting, he's really trying to keep his mental health together as well, even though he's so frustrated having to deal with a woman like this, but she completely takes advantage of this, and then he finds himself slipping into a routine where he ends up doing everything that she should be doing, or taking her share of what she should be contributing, and she'll just be very immature, you know, you'll get very immature behaviour from these people, they might not want to go and see your family, they might not want to invite your family or invite your friends over for iftar. Or they may not even come down to the dinner table at the time of iftar just because they don't like your sister or they don't like your brother or they don't like your mum. And again, it just causes unnecessary problems. And if a narc woman is on her period, oh, you can forget her doing anything for you during Ramadan. She Again, she'll make a huge drama about it and you might have made plans to invite your family over for iftar, she makes a drama, I'm not having your family around, you know, if you want them around, you cook, or you take them out to a restaurant, I'm not getting involved, I'm not coming with you, you go with them. Or she makes a problem about that as well, like she doesn't want him to go to his family house, or she doesn't want him taking them out. They're just a nightmare. They are so immature, they will give you so much stress that it just becomes unbearable going through Ramadan with these people. And this is the mission of the Qareen, of the man-child or the woman-child. It's to give you so much stress in Ramadan so you don't enjoy it. So you end up focusing more on the problems that you now have with this person than on your relationship with Allah, your relationship with the Qur'an and being able to enjoy your prayers. Now you're having sleepless nights, now you're fighting, now you're bickering. Now you're arguing over the dishes and you're arguing over, you know, her not wanting to come with you to see your family or him not wanting to invite your family over for iftar or him not setting a good example to the children and so on. You end up arguing and stressing over all of these things and then before you know it, Ramadan's flown by and you haven't done anything productive when it comes to your iman. And when it comes to you know, building a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you are so consumed in all of these petty dramas, this is from their qareen, okay? This is what their qareen wants them to do, to ruin your Ramadan so that you're not productive when it comes to your iman and you're consumed with unnecessary stress. Now, the third type of low-level naq is the one who uses Ramadan to love bomb their victim. So what I mean by this is the narcissist knows that if he or she shows a good side, a religious side to their parents or to their husbands or to their wives, then they will get that trust back. Okay, it's like, wow, okay, you know, they do have a good side. They are fasting Ramadan, they are making the effort, they're being really nice. All that abuse that I went through before Ramadan yeah, it was just, it's fine. I can brush under the carpet. It's long forgotten because now they're showing me in Ramadan that they're actually a nice person. That, you know, I'm enjoying uh, sharing the experience of fasting with them and having iftar with them and praying with them. These narcissists will use this tactic in Ramadan to either love bomb a victim or to hoover a victim. So, they will love bomb someone whom they're trying to impress by showing an overly exaggerated religious facade during the month. So 
you know, mashallah, the Akhi is always in the mosque. He's always praying taraweeh and tahajjud. He's doing atikaf. He's getting involved in fundraising and charity events and, and all of that. So when someone does that in Ramadan, it's because it's their prime time to do it. Okay, so they're fasting. They're like, what have I got to lose? I can't gain my haram source of supply right now. So I'm going to milk it for what it's worth. And so they show the religious facade and they impress who they want to impress with that. A lot of people fall for it. Loads of people fall for it. Only to be disappointed bitterly at the end of it when the person whom they... It could be someone whom, you know, a potential for marriage. You might have married this person thinking that they were so religious because it was their prime time to show you that religious identity and facade in Ramadan. You marry them only for them to be, you know, a descendant of Abu Jahl. Horrible, horrible person. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of people fall for this. A lot of people fall for this. And if they do it to hoover someone back in, it's because someone's walked away from them. Someone has had enough of dealing with them. And this could be any relationship. It could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be a husband or a wife or a sibling. They've just had enough of dealing with the narc. And now the narc is trying to prove him or herself to the person who walked away or cut the relationship that they're actually a nice person that they're actually a God-fearing person and it's to instill thoughts of self-doubt in the person who walked away. So now you see this person on their best behaviour in Ramadan after all the abuse you've been through and now you're starting to think, well, maybe I'm, maybe it's me, maybe I'm the narcissist, maybe I'm the one with the problem because he seems absolutely fine in Ramadan or she seems totally fine. Like, you know, they are being the practicing Muslim. I always, you know, admired them to be from the beginning. This is when they were love bombing you. They showed you that facade and then they slipped out of it. And now they're slipping back into it. So they're slipping back in to the role that they played when they love bombed you. So now you're being trauma bonded again when you're being hoovered in this way. So they're really putting on a show for you in Ramadan. And more often than not, victims get sucked back in. Okay, they start to think, okay, well, he's changed or she's changed. Let me resume a relationship with this person only for them to get completely screwed over later when they realise that it was just a show and as soon as Ramadan ended, they went back to who they truly are. Okay, now these are the narcissists who are borderline malignant now. It's the malignant ones who tend to do this more than the low-level narcs. Okay, so... We're talking about people who are man children, women children, but they lean more towards the malignant side. So it's the malignant narcissists who really put on this facade of being religious. They really go all out on it to deceive you, love bomb you and hoover you back in. So they will do all of these things during Ramadan. Now, there, like I said before, there's a minority of narcissists who will approach Ramadan as an opportunity to change. And these are people who are self-aware and people who genuinely want to make efforts to get better and to know Allah, to form a connection with him and to start with fasting as a way of, you know, disciplining their inner demon and just their desires in general. So there are narcissists who do have genuine intentions to do the best they can in Ramadan so that they can, inshallah, change for the better and more often than not people who go in with this intention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps them so he blesses them with the strength to be able to continue because he's pleased with them right even if the person is a narcissist Allah is pleased with them for wanting to try and you know making the efforts to improve so you'll find that narcissists who go into Ramadan with this intention will more often than not be consistent after Ramadan as well Okay, this is what I've seen from my experience. They do tend to be more consistent. Now, there are some who will slip back into their old ways. And that's because once the shayateen have been released, then they are unable to handle the stronger waswas. After Ramadan, now they've been used to dealing with a shakult qareen. And now that they're back to dealing with the full demon, 
Some find it very difficult to maintain control over their nafs and they allow the qareen to take control over them once again. So, you know, it's it's hard work. It's hard work um, coming out of narcissistic personality disorder because it requires consistent effort not a lot of narcissists are willing to make. So let's move on to the malignant narcissist and the narcopath. A narcopath is someone who is a borderline psychopath and they do everything, all the petty things that the man-child or the woman-child would do, but they are far more sinister and much worse. They are on a whole new level when it comes to being a nightmare. And every client I have spoken to has told me that every year, without fail, Ramadan is ruined because of the narcopath or the malignant narcissist in their life. So ruining your Ramadan is a basic standard for them. That's what they want to do because they are not fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, people who are controlled by their qareen, people who worship their qareen are not considered to be believers. So when they fast, they do it with different intentions. And more often than not, again, because these people have addictions, they find fasting a great inconvenience. And you will know that fasting is a great inconvenience when they keep pushing you to commit major sins while you're fasting. Now, these major sins could be you engaging in reactive abuse. So they may be provoking you for a horrid reaction to their abuse, they might be physically harming you, they may be taunting you, they may be engaging in tantrums and rages and all sorts of petty things so that you can engage in reactive abuse so that it invalidates your fasting because when you rage and you know get angry and all of that, you invalidate your fasting because now you've broken a core principle of the whole fast which is to restrain your anger and to, you know, practice morality. So they push you and provoke you to engage in that reactive abuse. Now, if that's happened to you, I would give charity on behalf of those days in which you acted out of character, just in case. It's just a redemption for, you know, engaging with the narcissist on that day and, you know, allowing yourself to be affected in that type of manner. So I just advise you this to help you feel better about yourselves if you feel guilty about invalidating your fast as a result of you know falling victim to this person's abuse and gaslighting and manipulation so like the man child and the woman child this person will feel frustrated as a result of not being able to regulate themselves with their addictions and their source of supply that they are used to having so Instead of them just being cranky and moody, you know, and sulky, like the man-child or the woman-child, the malignant narcissist will lash out, okay? They will scream at everyone, rage at everyone, shout, be verbally abusive. They may be physically abusive. They may smash things. They'll get road rage. You know, they, they act out in that manner because they are now more advanced than the low-level narc, okay? Remember, this; these people are on a whole other level. And the higher you go in your narcissism, the worse you will be at regulating your emotions. And so you will just lash out. You have no emotional intelligence. You will just lash out at everybody because you're frustrated that you do not have your crutch of supply that you need to get through life. And now you become frustrated at yourself because of how much you depend on those sources of supply or the addiction that you have to get you through life. You're now frustrated and disgusted at yourself and you lash out at yourself, you're lashing out at the world, you're lashing out at the people around you who, whom you see can regulate themselves properly and they don't need addictions, they don't need crutches, they don't need anything to rely on apart from you know, their own stability. They are, alhamdulillah, they're able to stand on their own two feet. They have trust in Allah. They have faith. They have self-confidence. They have self-esteem. They have self-worth. And they trigger. 
the narcissist in Ramadan more than any other time of the year. So when a narcissist sees that you're able to regulate your emotions and that you are fine as a person, you don't need addictions, you don't need anything, you trigger them. And when you trigger them, they hate you and they start treating you like they hate you. Okay, they start treating you like they really envy you, like they're really jealous of you. And you can't explain this behavior. You can't explain it. But they're so envious of how you can have a connection with Allah, how you can be so calm and so patient, and how you can be so emotionally stable. So you're not kicking off every five minutes and lashing out and looking like a clown. They don't like that you are calm and stable, and they're not. So it's actually quite ironic because they end up reacting in the same way they hate. Okay, so what they envy you for, instead of them copying it and getting better and taking your behavior and the way you live your life as inspiration, they decide to just rebel even more because they think, well, I've got nothing to lose. I might as well just be who I am and lash out. So the dangerous part about being around narcissists who envy you is the fact that they want to take away what they envy you for away from you, okay? It's not just jealousy where they wish they had it. No, it's jealousy and envy. And envy is when they wish that the blessing you have is not only given to them, but taken away from you as well. And then they start pushing you into major sins. They now start to try and disrupt your peace and your patience and your ability to actually cope with not eating and not drinking for the whole day. Now they're trying to push you into major sins to corrupt your fasting because now they need to feel better. Okay, now they need to feel better about being people who are not pleasant. They know there's something wrong with them. They may not know they have a disorder, but they definitely know that they're not good people. They know something's wrong with them. And you being around them as an empathic person, even if you're codependent, if you have empathy and you are able to exercise self-discipline and you can, you know, you can, you can be calm in situations and mature in situations, you're going to trigger them and they're going to destroy that in you. And that's why they mock you in Ramadan when you're fasting, when you're praying, when you're reading Quran, when you're seeking knowledge. You know, even if you're reading Quran and you're reading it out loud, they make fun of how you're reading. And they will, you know, joke about your tilawa. You might get up for tahajjud and they might be so angry with you. You might have irritated them. This is especially the case with men. So if you've had a marital problem with your husband and maybe you answered back, it's, it will be over something petty. He will make it known that he's not happy with you and that all the tahajjud you're praying and all this fasting that you're doing and all this Quran you're reading, it's going down the toilet because he's not happy with you. He will constantly remind you of that. He may even raise his hands and make dua against you. I'm going to do another podcast, inshallah, about the narcs who manipulate you by you know, openly praying against you or threatening to pray against you. That's a whole other subject. But they'll do these things in Ramadan to give you anxiety and so that you cannot enjoy Ramadan and so that you start thinking that you're a bad person. So a narcissistic, malignant husband will keep doing this. He will mock your deen. He will mock the way you practice Islam. And it's out of jealousy and envy. And he will also make it known that he's not happy with you. And he will give you the silent treatment as well. They are notorious for the silent treatment in Ramadan. And it's to keep your anxiety levels at an all-time high. Women do this as well. Narc women do this. So you might upset them with something very petty. You might have said something as a joke and they took offence to it. And now they're ignoring you for two or three days. Now she's told you to go and spend the rest of the week on the sofa. Or if it's your parent or your husband or wife, then, you know, getting the silent treatment from them during Ramadan when you're really trying to be a good Muslim and you're trying to do everything properly, having to deal with the silent treatment as well will give you so much anxiety, so much stress, because now you're going to believe that all your fasting is going to waste because your husband 
or your wife or your parent is not happy with you during Ramadan. So now you start to think, well, my, my prayers are not going to mean anything. You know, my fasting, everything that I'm doing, it's not going anywhere because these people are unhappy with me. They will gaslight you and manipulate you into, you know, compromising and sacrificing and being the person to apologize just to break the silent treatment, even though you're not in the wrong. They're known for this. This is something that they love, love doing in Ramadan because they know it works. They know it works on God-fearing people who worry about the implications and consequences of their parents not being pleased with them and so on. So they worry. You know, when, when your husband comes and tells you that you're not going to paradise until you obey me and until I'm happy and he's making it very difficult for you to earn his forgiveness, even though you're not in the wrong. You're not in the wrong. But he's making it difficult and dragging it out to make your life a living hell during Ramadan and so that you live in a constant state of anxiety. This is what they do. This is standard. So you'll find them intimidating and that's why more often than not you will be the one to break and apologise and make amends because they just become very intimidating. And their threats and their abusive behaviour scares you. And when it scares you, you start thinking about the kids. I don't want them seeing their father being like this with me. And I don't want the neighbours hearing and so on and so forth, right? I don't want dramas. I don't want the rest of Ramadan to be ruined. Let me just patch this up and get on with it because I can't, I can't live the rest of the month like this. And he gets away with it. He believes that you've enabled his behaviour now, it just gets worse, it doesn't get better, you think he appreciates that, and gets better, oh no, the rest of Ramadan is hell as well, he just steps it up a bit, or she steps it up a bit, she becomes even more of a nightmare, and she can't do anything without screaming, she can't communicate any small problem without screaming at everybody, and smashing things, and being overly dramatic, a lot of men go through this at home, they are fasting and have to deal with all this stress with a woman who is just a complete nightmare with him and the kids. And she may even pack her bags every five minutes and threaten to leave. Or she goes to her family house and switches off her phone for a few days. And just to give him anxiety, it's just because they don't want you to enjoy Ramadan. They want you to be in a constant state of anxiety. I can't say it enough. This is what they do. Now, if the malignant narcissist wants to step it up a level after all of this, what they do is that they push you into a major sin. Men and women both do this. Now, a major sin could be having intimate relations during fasting hours. This is prohibited. We know this is haram in Islam. No sexual contact can happen between husband and wife during fasting hours. But sometimes a husband or a wife will seduce their partner during fasting hours or they will constantly say you know I need it right now I can't do this I'm going to commit zina if I don't do it if I take a second wife it's going to be all your fault and so they end up scaring and pressurizing their partner who's really trying their best to you know fast Ramadan properly they force them into a major sin just to stop the problems, to stop the headache and the nagging and the constant issues around this subject. And sometimes the narcissist may even try to make the codependent partner feel better by saying, it's okay, I'm going to tell Allah to blame me for this sin that you're committing with me. You might remind them during the act or before that this is haram. You know, you've completely invalidated my fast. And he'll say, don't worry, don't worry about it. It's fine, I'll take the blame. I'll take the blame, don't worry about it. I'm the husband, I'll take the blame for you to make you feel better. Now, a codependent woman will fall for that or she will be highly pressurised into that. An imperfect woman or an imperfect man will put their foot down and they will not accept it. Okay, so it's more of a codependent trait that people compromise on their Islamic principles to accommodate the needs and the desires of someone else. And this is where people fall into shirk, okay? Because now you've put the needs of a human being above the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So, you know, this is how a lot of people fall into these major sins, by being convinced by the narcissist that, you know, it's it's not so major. It's not such a big deal for them to do this. So they'll say things like, don't worry, I'll pay the kafara, I'll pay for 60 poor people to have meals. And then they won't do that anyway, right? So even when Ramadan is over, they don't make up the fast, they don't pay the kafara, and you're left reeling in that guilt. So this is when they step it up a notch, okay? And sometimes malignant narcopaths will openly eat in front of you, they will openly smoke in front of you and be like, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, I don't want to fast. Some people are open about it. And these types of narcissists are more often than not liberals. So they're not the type of narcs who present the religious facade. They will be liberals. And they're not religious. They don't care about Ramadan. They don't care about any of that. So while they're at home with you, they will do everything that they want to do. Sometimes in front of the kids, which can be infuriating because you want this man or woman to be a role model for them. But because they're at home, they want to do whatever they want. And out in public, they show that they're fasting. They show that they are participating in Ramadan with everyone else. And this can be really annoying for the people who live with them because you wish that they could be more practicing and that they'd actually make an effort for once, but they have no no desire to. They have no intention to change or to become better. They will simply just do what they want and they will rub it in your face as well because they know it annoys you. They will eat in front of you and and do whatever it is that they do in front of you and they just won't care about how you feel about it. There's no respect whatsoever. And another thing they do, whether they're liberals or, you know, they pretend to be religious, is they will nitpick on everything. So, for example, you've cooked something they don't like, they'll complain about it. You haven't made their favourite food, they'll complain about it. You haven't put 10 different dishes on the table, they'll complain about it. They will complain about everything. They will always find something to complain about when it comes to the food that you serve them. So it's too hot or too cold, or it's not like their mums, or there aren't enough carbs on the plate, or not enough protein on the plate. It just doesn't stop. You know, they'll nitpick about the salt. They might even throw the whole plate in the bin, right? All the contents of the plate, they will throw it in the bin in front of you just to make a point. And you think they care about na'mat Allah, you know, about the blessing of food. They don't care about any of that. If it's going to show you how angry they are, if it's going to prove a point, oh, the whole plate will go in the bin. And in front of the kids as well. They are never grateful for anything that you do. Even if you go out of your way to, you know, to serve a wonderful spread, they're still going to find something to complain about. And if it's not about the food, the complaints will transmit to your appearance. So, for example, they might say things like, why are you dressed like that? You look like a homeless woman. Or why do you smell like that? You stink of onions and garlic. Could you not have a shower? Do you not know how to have a shower? And why are you not all glammed up? He's forgetting that you've spent the last four hours in the kitchen to have everything put on the table, hot, and you didn't have time to go and glam up and go and have a shower and go and look your best. He's not thinking about all of that. He's just looking for something to complain about, okay? He will look for the impossible and the things that he knows you couldn't do at that time. But it's just to put you down, okay? It's just to put you down so that even when other people are complimenting you about the food, he has to bring you down with comments about your appearance. So even if you reach for the sweets on the table, right? You you fancy some sweets or desserts, whatever's on the table, and he'll say something like, Have you not looked at yourself in the mirror lately? I don't think you should be touching that. I think you should be focusing on losing weight this Ramadan. They do things like that and they say things like this in front of other people, even if those other people are guests, right? They will say these things to put you back in your place because people would have inflated your ego by telling you how amazing the food is and what a wonderful chef you are and what a wonderful wife you are, what wonderful mother you are. He's feeling uncomfortable. He's like, no, we can't have that. 
let me say something, let me say an inappropriate joke at the dinner table in front of everyone or an inappropriate comment that will bring her back down to earth because we can't have her feeling good about herself. This is something a lot of men do in particular. Now, women do it as well at the dinner table at iftar time and they will also make fun of their husbands in front of other people to bring him down. So let's say he's the one who cooked the iftar meal and he let people know that or they asked who cooked the meal and he said, oh, it was me who cooked today. And they look at the wife being like, well, you know, you let your husband do all of this. What do you, what do, you do? And she now feels embarrassed, OK, because everyone now knows that he's the one who did everything. And so she will drop a comment like, well, yeah, it's the only thing he's good at, really. And it will really upset him because he did you know, genuinely make that effort because it's her family coming over or his family coming over. And she drops a comment like that, that emasculates him and makes him feel like garbage. They have to do it. They can't help it. They have to do it because they don't like it when other people love you and compliment you. They want all the attention on themselves. They want to have all the compliments and they're the ones who need their egos feeding because they live off that ego and they worship that ego so they have to feed the deity they worship right they've got to offer gifts and offer praise and compliments because that's what keeps the ego happy that's what keeps the qareen happy and so when they see the attention is on their victim oh they can't have that lord almighty that can't happen so they have to bring you down a peg or two and they do it deliberately they know exactly what they're doing. You think that they don't know what they're doing? You're giving them the benefit of the doubt? I'm telling you, they know exactly what they're doing. It's a game. It's manipulation. It's how they operate. Because they always have to be on top. They always have to have that control. Now, I know this podcast will probably trigger a few people. And I know it's going to be upsetting to listen to all of this. But I really want you to process it. Because I want you to feel validated that you're not going crazy that this is something a lot of people go through. I want you to know that. And I want you to understand that this is a part of their disorder so that you stop taking it personally, so you stop blaming yourself for them being the way they are, no matter how hard you try to keep the peace and keep the family together. So it has to be said. All of this has to be said so that people come to the realisation of what they are dealing with. So the more people are aware of this problem and this disorder, the more effectively they'll be able to deal with people like this who have it, and the more likely they will be to avoid people who have traits of narcissism, okay, who have all those red flags in the beginning. So I'm doing all this work, I'm recording all of these podcasts for you to understand the sheer horror of what you could face if you were to ignore and underestimate the red flags that you see pop up in the beginning with someone who is narcissistic, I promise you this is what you're going to go through on so many different levels. And it's not worth it. It's not worth going through all this with someone who has no intention of ever changing. Okay, because like I said, the majority of them will not. There are exceptions to the rule, always. But the majority of people do not change who have MPD. So don't marry anyone out of hope that you can fix them, that you can help them, that you can heal them. This is what you're going to go through, right? This is how you're going to get repaid with this abuse, with this kind of life, this low quality of life, living with someone who has a demonic spirit who is out to cripple and destroy you, okay? They want everything you have and they will never get better as long as there are people around to enable this terrible behaviour, because people don't know how to deal with them. Okay, when you don't know how to deal with them, when you're easily intimidated by them, and easily controlled and manipulated, you don't help yourself and you don't help them either. Because the more someone tolerates this behaviour, the worse they get. They just keep taking more of that rope, and they keep pushing more boundaries, until they become psychopathic. Okay, that's how people end up murdering their victims because the abuse just keeps going because there's no one to stop them. There's nothing to stop them. So please take it seriously. Wallahi, what you go through is a piece of hell on earth. 
These people need therapy, they need help. Because all of this is not normal behaviour and they know it's not normal behaviour. They know it very well. Trust me when I tell you, they know what they're doing. When they're screaming at their parents in Ramadan, when they are super rude to their parents in Ramadan, you think they don't know? You think they're completely possessed? No, they're not completely possessed. They are controlled by their qareen, yes, but they have a brain to think with as well. Allah gave us a brain so that we can find an escape out of our spiritual problems. We can think logically about a solution in order to be able to come out of this disorder, come out of our problems. Right? We have intelligence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, out of his mercy, gave us intelligence so that we can figure our way out of problems and find solutions. These are people who know they need to do inner work, but as long as they've got people enabling them and tolerating them, why should they change? They're perfectly happy, you know, being the way they are and continuing this way. So if storming out of iftar and slamming the door behind them because you didn't make the dessert properly or you didn't serve food at the temperature they wanted, if that's going to intimidate you, and scare you into compliance, then that's exactly what they're going to do. You're going to see them storm out of the room and make a huge drama. You're going to see them rage over petty things. You're going to see them refuse to visit your family in Ramadan for iftar, but they pressurize you to go and visit their narcissistic family. And the only reason why they don't want to go and visit your family is because someone in your family has clocked on to who they really are. Okay, and they're keeping a close eye on them and they've noticed. And so they no longer feel comfortable visiting your family anymore because they feel exposed. They know someone has noticed something and they're keeping an eye on him or her. So they really hate this, you know, and that's why they try to isolate you even more. And when they refuse to go to your family home, they know it's going to cause problems. And when you have problems, you're now left to choose between your husband or your wife and your family. And it just goes on and on and on. I could list you so many things that they do, but you you get my point, right? Each one of you will have your own case if you're experiencing this. So you can apply your own experiences to what I'm saying. I had a client tell me that sometimes she would try and wake her husband up for suhoor. And because he was so tired, he wouldn't get up. So she would tell him, look, if you don't eat now, you know, fudges coming in and you're going to miss the window for it. And he would just tell her, just go away, leave me alone. I'm tired, just let me sleep. So she'd let him sleep. And in many cases, he never even got up for fudger either. So he'd get up the next day and go about his day. And because he didn't eat suhoor, he would be really cranky all day and he would blame her for it. So he would go into rages, he would be so abusive and he would blame it on him not having suhoor and she's baffled because she's like well I tried to wake you up and he blames her for the abuse that he's subjecting her to during the day because he didn't have suhoor but she'll try and wake him up the next day after going through all of that abuse and he will do the same thing where he will not get up to eat she said to the point where I would bring him food to the bedside table so that he would get up and eat so that I don't have to go through the abuse the next day as well. But he wouldn't get up to eat. And the reason why he doesn't get up to eat, even though the food is right next to him, is because he now knows that he can use that excuse to abuse and make the next day of Ramadan a living hell for her as well. So it's like dealing with a child. This is childish behaviour. These narcissists are stuck in childhood mode. They are emotionally stunted to act like children because they're not emotionally mature enough to process their emotions and communicate as mature adults. Okay, this is across the board with all narcissists. They do very well in their careers and in the outside world, but at home, they're terrible. Emotionally, they are awful. So you will always feel like you're dealing with a child. I had another client who told me that they had two cats at home. So she's got children they all live under one roof and she is married to a malignant narcissist. And she said that um, one day he got so mad at everybody because he's so cranky from not eating. He just blows up over every tiny little thing. 
And they stood up to him and they said, look, you know, we, we don't like this. We don't like this behavior. It has to stop. And she said the next day, you know, I brought the kids back from school and the cats were gone. And he'd gone and taken them to a cat rescue as punishment because they stood up to him. And she said the kids were so devastated that I spent the rest of Ramadan consoling the children who hated their father even more for doing that. And she said it just ruined our entire Ramadan. It ruined Eid completely. And this is something, again, they're notorious for. They love ruining special occasions. They love ruining Eid in particular. So when they come out of Ramadan and they get worse because the devils are now unchained and they can go back to who they were, they ruin Eid for you. Because again, it's something that's connected to the deen. It's something that you know, earns the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go to pray Eid prayer, when you, you know, you have new clothes and you make a nice day out of it, they ruin it. They ruin it for you. And they may even ruin it just by not buying you nice clothes or not buying you a gift or not doing anything special for Eid. They might just want to stay at home or she doesn't want to do anything. She just wants to go out with her friends or she wants to spend Eid with her family and she doesn't care about what you do. You know, she tells you, you go with your family, I'm going with my family. Um, so they do things that make you feel unloved, unwanted, unworthy. And again, because it's something connected to the deen, it's a celebration connected to Ramadan and what you managed to achieve in Ramadan and all of that. So they can't allow you to have a good time. And sometimes they will allow you to have a good time because it gives them a good image. So if it's being done in front of people, they will allow you to have a nice time at Eid, but then they go back to their normal self. So if they were on their best behavior during Ramadan, they're going to go back to their normal self after Eid. If their intention was not to reform, if their intention was just to hoover you or love bomb you, you will find that they slip quickly back into their old self. Okay, and life just becomes miserable again. And if they were awful during Ramadan, they're going to be awful during Eid. You can guarantee that, okay? Unless they're putting on a show for other people, you can guarantee that you're going to have a very miserable Eid with these people too. And they will not make it special for you. They will make it a bad memory. They will turn it into a bad memory. And a common way that they turn it into a bad memory is when they break big news to you on that day. For example, they might choose Eid day to tell you that they have found a second wife or that they've got married or that they've had a child with someone else or that they want a divorce. Okay, well, come on that day, the day where everyone is supposed to be having a good time, they will break horrible news to you. Now, to you, it's horrible, right? To a codependent, the news of divorce is horrible, to an empath, it's music to their ears, okay? <laughs> the best thing they could hear. But to a codependent who doesn't want a divorce for many different reasons, it terrifies them. It's crippling, it's devastating for them to hear the words anti talaq or I want a divorce on Eid day. On Eid day. And sometimes they do this during Ramadan, okay? They choose Ramadan to issue a talaq. And sometimes they will over-dramatize it. So, you know, you get the men who issue, I call it the machine gun talaq, where they will say it in a fit of rage. Like it's coming out of a machine gun because they want maximum effect. They want to terrify you when they give so many talaqs, like that's it, it's irrevocable, we're finished. So that you spend... The rest of Ramadan, crying, grieving, begging, and bending over backwards so that they take you back. Okay, when a man does this, I've spoken about it in a previous podcast about the problematic ways in which narcissists divorce their spouses. When they do that, it's only counted as one talaq and it's valid. And the reason why it's valid is because scholars only gave the exception of a talaq issued in anger to someone who is not naturally an angry person. So when scholars said 
that a talaq said in anger is invalid, it applies to the empathic Muslim men who are out of character when they do that. However, a talaq is considered to be valid when a narcissistic man says it in anger. Why? Because that's his nature. Okay, how many times is he going to do that and tell you, oh, I said it out of anger? He will always do it out of anger because they use it as manipulation. So when a narcissistic man issues a talaq, it's valid because he is an angry person. So he meant it when he did it. He knows exactly what he was doing. But when an empathic man issues a talaq in a fit of rage or when he's super upset, is considered to be invalid if he takes it back. If he says, you know what, I didn't mean it. I was so angry that I issued a talaq, but I didn't mean it. Scholars here say that this man's talaq is invalid. It, you know, it's not counted as a talaq because it's not like him to be like that. So they will manipulate you and play you at this game during Ramadan, during your birthday, during your anniversary, during Eid. Where they will issue talaqs and then come back and say, oh, I didn't mean it, I was angry. So many people, I've said this many times before, are in invalid marriages because they have been divorced more than five times by their husband in these special occasions. And uneducated imams have said, it doesn't count. All of these talaqs don't count because they were said in anger. We really have a problem with this in our ummah. Okay, with ignorant and uneducated imams who do not look at the bigger picture when it comes to dealing with women and what they go through when they are divorced during Ramadan and during Eid, especially in those periods of times. So this is a huge manipulation tactic that they use, which is breaking bad news to you in special occasions. And it's always to punish you for something. There is always something that they want to punish you for. They love to give punishments. They love to make you feel that you're not good enough as a Muslim. That, Like I said, they'll always nitpick on everything you're doing or not doing, you know, so that you always feel like no matter what I do to be a good Muslim and to be a good wife or to be a good husband or to be a good, you know, child or, or whatever, it's never good enough. And you're always living in this state of depression and anxiety because you can never make these people happy. I'll tell you now, you never can because they're not happy with themselves. You can never make someone happy if they're not happy within themselves. They hate themselves. So no matter what you do, you could bring them the moon and the sun to show them you love them and care about them. But if you're giving that to someone who hates themselves, you will never get far in life with them. You will never get far. And that's why so many people live in misery because they're like, well, I've done this and I've done this. What more could I possibly do to make this woman happy? What more could I do to make this man happy, to make my parents happy? I've sacrificed my entire life for them and they're still not happy and they never will be. They never will be because it's a part of their disorder. And the sooner people know this, the better. Okay, the sooner people know this, the better. Now, this podcast... I'm sure narcissists will listen to this as well. I know people do. It's for you to better yourself. It's for you to understand your disorder from a spiritual perspective and how the shayateen affect you and control you for you to be like this. And I've said it a hundred times. If narcissists do not fix up before their time comes on this earth, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. For putting people through this torture, through this hell, unnecessarily. You're going to be accountable for all this. You've still got time. You've still got a chance. If you're listening to this, it's out of Allah's love and mercy for you that he's giving you some extra time to wake up and change yourself. Wake up and understand that you are a complete slave to your qareen. You are a complete slave to a jinn. You are more powerful than the jinn. You are more powerful than these creatures made of fire. You know, with just Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or A'udhu Billahi min ash-Shaytan ar-Rajim, you burn them, they disappear. So that's how weak narcissists are when they allow a jinn to overpower a human being 
and Allah has given us the ability to have full control over the jinn. So if you're listening to this and you don't wake up, I'm telling you, you're not going to face a good end. Especially when you inflict this type of abuse on people in the holy months. These are holy months. People do this in Hajj. You know there are narcissists who abuse, physically abuse their family members in Hajj, in Umrah. Like, I've heard things. I've heard things. And it's got to stop. So if you're hanging around waiting for a miracle... For these narcissists to change so that you can have a harmonious life with them, I'll tell you from now, you're more likely to see elephants fly before that happens. Because the power is actually with the person who puts a barrier up and doesn't allow a narcissist to affect them in their life. Because when that barrier is up, there's nothing that narcissists can do. There's nothing they can do. They have to move on to another victim. Because you have it as a principle to not allow people like that into your life and to deal with these people, okay? If you're going through a marriage with someone like this or if you have knock parents, I advise you go for mediation to try and come up with a, a solution for the problems that you're going through and if they don't allow you to get a mediator involved, then you need to start taking some practical steps to distance yourself from them because wallahi, it doesn't get better, they get worse every year. It's a disorder that doesn't get better. It's a disorder that gets worse every year if they do not address the issues, the internal issues that they are running away from. So just to summarise, what you see in Ramadan from someone is a reflection of their true character, whether that person be an empath, a codependent, a narcissist or a psychopath. Their true self will come out in Ramadan. And if someone is on their best behaviour during Ramadan, you will know if they are sincere or not, if they are able to be consistent with that behaviour after Eid. Okay, so if they go back to their old ways, you know that all of that was just a show, it was just a facade, because they wanted something out of it. But if they're consistent after Eid, then you know that this is actually their character. You know, they are a good person, they are trying, and their intentions are good. So I'll end it here. I hope that's given you some clarity and an understanding of what happens to the narcissist brain and their disorder during the month of Ramadan. And I'd like to advise you to please, please always pray for your protection. When you make dua, please ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from the evil jinn and the evil humans, okay? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min shar shayateen al-ins wa shayateen al-jinn. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evil of the jinn devils and the human devils. So that even if the narcissist in your life or the narcissists in your life try to ruin who you are as a person, they try to degrade you, they try to belittle you, they try to cripple who you are as a Muslim and as a human being or as a man or as a woman, they won't have that level of effect on you negatively because you've been protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of that dua. Okay, so always protect yourself by, you know, praying for your protection, pray for the protection of your children and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens their eyes, you know. At the end of the day, you know, we want to help them too. Just pray that Allah opens the eyes of these narcissists so that, they can address their issues and they can become better because ultimately we benefit from that as well. Okay, so you're praying for something that's of benefit to you. Pray that Allah opens their eyes, pray that Allah guides them, especially if you're in a marriage with them or they're your parents or they're your siblings, pray for them. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer that dua for you. So I'll end it here. Thank you so much to everyone who is still with me listening until now. If you have any questions or comments, you can drop them below. Or even if you want to share your experiences, it's always you know good and helpful for others to see that there are other people in the same boat as them. So I pray that you have found this helpful, inshallah. Please do like it if you found it beneficial. Do share it with other people whom you feel could benefit from it. And do subscribe to the channel if you want more related content. If you go to the community tabs in my channel, you will see on my first post, 
a list of upcoming subjects that I inshallah intend to speak about. So if you want some information on those, do subscribe. Just hit the bell icon and you'll be notified whenever I drop a podcast. And you can also join my newsletter on the website and you'll be notified that way as well. And you'll get some extra info uh, sent to your inbox. And as I mentioned earlier, I do offer one-to-one counselling and coaching. You can email me to the address below in the description box. And if you haven't read the book yet, do grab a copy. It's called The Muslim Narcissist and it has all the foundational information in there for you to understand personality disorders from an Islamic perspective. So I hope you enjoy the rest of Ramadan, inshallah, and that it somewhat becomes more bearable with narcissists now that you know this information so that you can deal with it more effectively and in a way in which you do not take everything that happens personally so it doesn't affect your self-esteem and your self-worth and your iman. Okay, that's the most important thing that you have to protect in all of this. Always make sure that your iman is intact and that no one destroys that for you. Okay, so best of luck with that, inshallah. I pray for all of you. So until the next podcast, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.